Let's dive in. Verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it's good for a man to remain as he is. Now, we often say that 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 to 40 is a passage about singleness. Uh, that isn't, it's not quite true, is it? Um, it's true that this passage has a lot to say about the ultimate significance and some of the temporary benefits of singleness and marriage. But actually, Paul is addressing quite a specific issue here. Um, should the betrothed in Corinth, um, should they go through with their weddings? Or as I've paraphrased it, um, under what circumstances might you choose not to marry? And you might put in brackets, for the time being. It's worth taking a moment to reorient ourselves. And if you were here two weeks ago, you'll remember that Paul has been addressing matters raised by the Corinthians. Uh, At the beginning of the chapter, he quoted their letter. Um, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. And they appear to have expressed the view uh, that celibacy is straightforwardly superior to marriage. And Paul has spent the last 24 verses correcting them. No, the call of the gospel is not a call out of the marriage relationship. Married Christians should stay married, um, even to a non-Christian. Married Christians should stay fully married. Um, Sex within marriage is good. In fact, as we saw last week, so far, from being a call out of our social positions, the call of the gospel has reached us where we are. And the default is that we will therefore remain where we are. But what about the not yet married? Uh, What about the betrothed? Um, Is the call of the gospel a call for them to reconsider? Um, Actually, I think that this is the real nub of the issue in 1 Corinthians 7. Um, The way that Paul has written both verse 25 and verse 40, uh, much more defensive than anything else in the chapter, uh, rather implies that this is the sharp end of the chapter. Uh, The implication seems to be that the Corinthians' blanket celebration of chastity, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, was really angled at the betrothed. The Corinthians, I guess, were saying something like this. Paul, given that it is good for a man not to touch a woman, don't you think that these youngsters ought to call their betrothals off? (laughs) Maybe it was more pointed still. I wonder if you ever thought about this, but how many betrothed couples do you think there really were um, in the Corinthian church? I don't imagine it was a whole phalanx. What if there was just one? Uh, Do you think they should call their betrothal off? It can't have been many. Uh, Paul's answer in verses 25 to 40 is absolutely brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant because there is a sense in which he is agreeing with the Corinthians. Yes, as it happens, I do agree that it might be better for them to hold off the wedding. But he agrees in a way that explodes all of their categories um, and might explode some of ours as well. In fact, in the end, I think 1 Corinthians 7 is one of the strongest defenses of Christian freedom anywhere in the New Testament. And my prayer this morning is that this chapter might liberate us. Why might you choose not to marry? Uh, Well, the, the argument, it breaks down into three broad movements. Firstly, there is an initial statement of Paul's advice. Then he gives his underlying reasoning And then there's the specific application to the matter at hand. Let's start with the summary statement, verse 25. Paul writes, now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife, but if you do marry, you haven't sinned. And if a betrothed woman married, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I'd spare you that. Under what circumstances might you choose not to marry? Well, firstly, now is a good time to remain as you are. And now is a good time to remain as you are. And right off the bat, you can see that Paul is reframing the issue. It might look like he's agreeing with their letter, but he's coming at it from a very different angle. Why do I say that? 
Well, firstly, there's the way that he's written verse 26. And Paul's Greek here is actually very clumsy. Um, it, it literally reads something like this. Um, Therefore, I think this to be good because of the present distress. It is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, the reason it's clumsy is that Paul has taken their statement from verse 1, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, and he has recast it. No, I think this to be good. It is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, Paul's recasting of the issue is even clearer when you see what he says about why it is good for a man to remain as he is. And verse 20, it's not about sin and righteousness. It's not about good and evil. It's not about obedience and disobedience. It is not about what Jesus wants. Um, Verse 25, what he's about to say is not a command. It is an opinion. It is advice. Verse 28, whatever the betrothed decide to do in this matter, they have not sinned. And again, verse 28, Paul's motive, in fact, is not to make them more godly or to make them more keen. It is to spare them from worldly troubles. It's quite a shift. The Corinthians have led on the thought that it is better, just better, more good, more godly, you might say, to be celibate. And Paul says, no, this is not about what Jesus wants. This is not about avoiding sin. When I say this is good, I mean it is better for you. This is the path to a less troubled life, fewer anxieties. It is for your benefit. And Paul's reason for thinking that holding off the wedding might be good, um, a good interruption, is actually very down to earth. Uh, Verse 26 again. I think that in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Um, Under what circumstances might you choose not to marry? Well, now is a good time to remain as you are because, Paul says, of the present distress. I mentioned at the start that there are one or two key interpretive issues um, that make this chapter a bit tricky, and this is one of them. Uh, What does Paul mean by the present distress? Now, actually, I think the very best way to read this is as the current troubles, as in things that were making life sticky for Paul and for the Corinthians then and there. It'd be easy to speculate further. We know, for example, um, that there was a major famine in Europe at the time that Paul wrote this letter because he ends the letter by appealing for the Corinthians to join his famine relief project. And we know that there is some sort of plague in Corinth because the Corinthians are growing sick and dying. Um, And we know that Paul himself is writing out of the midst of riots political turmoil, and perhaps a recent prison sentence. What do I gain if I fought beasts at Ephesus, he says. Taken together, Paul summarizes the current moment as a troublous time. And in view of the troubled times, not as a command, as advice, Paul says, now is a good moment to remain as you are. Now, if that's the general advice, in the following verses, 29 to 35, he then spells out a bit more of his reasoning. And the underlying reasoning unfolds in two parts. Firstly, Paul reminds the Corinthians that the things of this age are passing away. Verse 29. Uh, This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the form, for the scheme of this world, is passing away. Uh, The basic thrust of these verses is that the things of this age aren't ultimate. Um, Actually, we already knew that from last week for another reason. Remember last week, we saw that the call of God has rendered our obsession with social position hierarchy and relationship status irrelevant. Circumcised or uncircumcised, slave or free, married or single, it is of no consequence so far as the call of God is concerned. But that's especially true when you remember that this whole age is passing away. Buying, selling, dealing with the world, 
marrying and giving in marriage, rejoicing and mourning, those things feel like the stuff of life. They are the stuff of life, but they are not the stuff of eternal life. And in the truly grand scheme of things, they are fleeting. The day of the Lord is coming. And when it does, your relationship status won't matter. Actually, it may be that the connection between this paragraph and the present distress could be slightly tighter. Uh, Perhaps Paul looked at the current troubles, famine and turmoil and plague, and he thought, yes, this is an especially birth-pangy moment. And birth-pangy, that is an an adjective, it really is. Um, Especially birth-pangy moment. Uh, The age before Jesus returns will be full of birth-pangy moments, won't it? Wars, rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes in various places. And at birth, pangy moments, we're being reminded that this age and the scheme of this age is passing away. And those moments, the birth pang moments, are especially difficult for nursing mothers and for pregnant women. And so, Paul says, at this birth pangy moment, for your benefit, to spare you, now might be a good moment to remain as you are. Uh, On the one hand, this is a very helpful reminder, I think. Our relationship status is not ultimately significant. Uh, The Southeast Asian students in the room, um, they might already have begun to feel the pinch of this. Um, All those chats with the aunties at the Chinese New Year reunion dinners. Uh, When are you going to get married? Uh, When are you going to have a family? Um, Is there a nice young man that you're going to introduce to us? I, I imagine it gets pretty wearing after a while. Of course, it is understandable that families think this way. Uh, Betrothals, weddings, grandchildren, that's what families thrive on. It's the stuff of life. It'd be churlish to be too grumpy about it. But it's not the stuff of eternal life. Uh, Whether or not you get married, whether or not there are any grandchildren, it doesn't ultimately matter. There'll be plenty of people here who struggle to be content with their relationship status. Uh, Single people who would love to be married, uh, who wish they had a choice in whether or not they were. Married people who might wish that they were single. Uh, This passage, I said, it's not directly about singleness, not in the abstract. But this reminder might help those amongst us who wish that they weren't. But the scheme of this world, business, property, wedding, celebrations, it won't last forever. It is a passing shadow. It's a helpful reminder to us all. The things of this age are passing away. So on the one hand, it's a helpful reminder. But on the other, do you see how Paul is beginning to reframe the issue? Do you see how he is staking out the ground for Christian liberty? Precisely because relationship status is not an ultimate thing, neither marriage nor singleness, marriage nor celibacy are ultimate goods, Paul is opening up the space to give advice that is, frankly, very mundane. Because the next part of Paul's reasoning is very mundane. And here's the second part of his reasoning. Step one, relationship status doesn't ultimately matter. The scheme of this world is passing away. And so, step two, if you do get married, you will add to your anxieties. If you do get married, you'll add to your anxieties. Verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. And the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, literally not to put a noose around your necks, but to promote good order and secure your undistracted devotion to the Lord. I think we often read this paragraph quite badly. And firstly, we use it to say that the primary benefit of singleness is that it increases your capacity for gospel ministry. But Paul just doesn't say that in this paragraph. He just doesn't. And then secondly, 
we say that single people are uniquely positioned for holiness and for devotion to the Lord. And actually, I'm not quite sure that that is what Paul's saying either. Paul doesn't say in this paragraph that his aim is to get you to do more stuff. He says very explicitly that his aim is to free you from anxieties. The point is that everybody is anxious. There's no one in the paragraph who's not anxious in 32 to 35, but there are shared anxieties, and then there are additional anxieties. And here is what is shared. All Christians, any Christian who has paid attention to the implications of the gospel call and the sanctifying work of Jesus, all Christians are concerned, or at least they ought to be concerned, for holiness in body and spirit, and for wholehearted devotion to the Lord's. I just go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Holiness in body and spirit and devotion to the Lord is a shared preoccupation of Christians. But if you marry, you will take on extra concerns, more anxieties, and more um, worries, more distractions, Paul says. Of course, the point is not that single people um, serenely float through life without a trouble in the world, um, humming hakuna matata under their breath. Um, No, at a troubled time, at a troubled time, everybody will have anxieties. But, well, perhaps a slightly crude illustration helps. Um, Imagine that you were living in Ukraine right now. Um, I don't imagine that many of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine at the minute are without anxiety uh, right now. But a brother with a young family has even more to worry about than one without. I don't think Paul's point is that single people are uniquely positioned to be holy or concerned for devotion to the Lord. But given that you're already anxious about that, or you should be, and given that there's a lot of trouble about at the minute, do you really want to add to your anxieties, Paul is saying? And so Paul says, for your good, for your benefit, to spare you from anxieties, to spare you from trouble, here's some advice. Take it or leave it. Now is a good time to remain as you are. And again, it's so liberating. Uh, The word of God is preaching freedom here. The Corinthians have gone about binding consciences They have cast a noose and laid a restraint. Wouldn't it be better, just more good, more godly, if these young couples stayed apart? And that is exactly what Paul refuses to do. No, it doesn't matter, he says. Marriage, singleness, a short engagement, a long engagement. Those are all part of the scheme of this world that is passing away. Devotion to the Lord, that matters, of course. But whether or not a young couple marry... Well, that is neither here nor there. And yet, and yet here is something that does matter to me, says Paul. It matters to me that people are not unduly anxious. It matters to me that people are not unhappily troubled. It matters to me that your life isn't harder than it needs to be. It's just a thought. But have you thought about doing the easier thing? Paul is so kind, isn't he? The word of God is so kind, isn't it? I want to free you from anxieties. And so Paul comes to his specific application. Now, um, this is the paragraph that I'm afraid, I think the ESV's handled the least well. Um, And I was going to print um, another translation on your handout, and I forgot, as I said, um, which is a real bother. But anyway, verse 36, I'm going to read from the um, CSB Um, You'll be able to spot the difference, I think, if you pay attention. Verse 36. If any man thinks he is acting improperly toward the virgin he's engaged to, if she is getting beyond the usual age for marriage, and he feels he should marry, he can do what he wants. He's not sinning. They can get married. But he who stands firm in his heart, who's under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and has decided in his heart to keep her as his fiancée, will do well. So then he who marries his fiancé does well, but he who does not marry will do better. Again, the key is that bit in verse 36. Um, 
uh, if um, anyone thinks that he's acting improperly toward the virgin he's engaged to, and if she is getting beyond the usual age of marriage and he feels he should marry, he can do what he wants. Uh, so here is Paul's specific application um, at the end of the chapter. Uh, you might, you might want to postpone the wedding. Again, it's so important that we don't overread Paul here. He isn't saying, I want you to be single. He isn't saying, break off the engagement. He isn't even saying, defer the wedding. He's saying, you might want to defer the wedding. Maybe. Um, actually, he places the bar for that quite high in verse 37. And he gives four conditions. Number one, if the man knows his own heart, condition one. And number two, um, if he's under no compulsion, um, actually it's the same word as the word from verse 26, the word for distress. Um, I think it means if he's not distressed, if he's not troubled by this decision, if he knows his own heart and it doesn't upset him. And number three, he has control over his own will. In other words, it is his decision to make. Um, it's actually up to him. Um, and number four, he has genuinely decided in his heart. If all of those four things are true, then he says, well, defer the wedding. I guess Paul is saying, wait until this particularly troublesome time has passed. Um, otherwise, he's just asking them to keep their fiancés until Jesus comes back, which strikes me as unrealistic advice. Uh, wait until this particularly troublesome time has passed. But, verse 36, he says, if waiting would be unkind to the woman that you're betrothed to, or if it would be socially inappropriate, or if you just want to get married, go ahead. Actually, he deliberately echoes their letter here, not just go ahead, it is good, it is good. He says more or less the same thing about widows in verse 39. Yes, yes, I think she'll be happier if she remains as she is for the time being. But do you know what? If her husband is dead, she is free. And so here is the application. You might want to defer the wedding. It's so wonderfully down to earth, isn't it? In fact, it's so down to earth that Paul feels the need to remind the super spiritual Corinthians that he is faithful, verse 25, and that he does have the spirit of God, verse 40. But it turns out that true spirituality is not displayed in vague pagan ideas about the benefits of perpetual virginity. True spirituality has a firm enough grasp on the coming age to realize that relationship status is secondary. And true spirituality has a firm enough grasp on this age to actually want to care about people's temporal benefits. And so here is Paul. Wouldn't it be better, they said, more godly, if these fiancés didn't marry? Well, he says, it might be better to postpone the wedding. For now, you'd probably be happier but that's all there is to it. And if you want to go ahead, go ahead. As I said, it's the most extraordinary defense of Christian freedom. And do you see what Paul has done? On the superficial level, he has offered some sort of agreement. Now, don't you think it'd be better if these young women didn't marry? Well, well sure, it might be. Superficially, that is agreement. But underneath that, he has completely exploded their categories. And we speak about damning someone with faint praise. I wonder, can you damn someone with faint agreement? Because it seems to me that that is precisely what Paul has done here. You silly Corinthians, the level of your concern is both too high and too low. It's too low. You're hung up, hung up on circumstance, marriage and singleness, virginity and, and, and family, circumcision and uncircumcision when you should be worrying about the ultimate things, the call of God, the end of all things, the knowledge of God in Christ, holiness in body and spirit. You set your gaze too low. The things that you think really matter are passing, fleeting. And the things that do matter, devotion to the Lord, fleeing sexual immorality, holiness in body and spirit, they're not really on your radar. The Corinthians are, are like the third-year students, paralyzed over the question of which career God would have them do whilst they're sleeping with their girlfriend the whole time. On the one hand, their gaze is set much too low, and yet also simultaneously too loftily high. 
Because whilst they are binding consciences and laying snares and putting nooses around people's necks with high-minded ideas about the superiority of celibacy, they're not actually looking after people. You silly Corinthians. It doesn't matter whether your daughter gets married or not. It matters that she's a Christian and it matters that her life is not unnecessarily hard. Why don't you spend a bit less time worrying about the perfect position in society for her and a bit more time sparing her from anxiety? It's no surprise, is it, really? The prayer book talks about how the the service of the Lord is perfect freedom. And it's true. Once you get a grasp, get a handle on what really matters, it sets you free to be kind and to be sensible in the things that don't. And so Paul's purpose this morning is, I think, to liberate us. Uh, Let me be very clear. Paul's aim in 1 Corinthians 7 is not to persuade you that really we would all be more godly if we could be single. In fact, I think that is almost the opposite of what he's saying. His aim is to persuade you that whether you are married or single is radically secondary to the fact that you are Christian. In fact, it is so secondary that if it is up to you, you can make the decision on entirely other grounds. What will bring you more anxiety? What will be more socially fitting? What's the best way to survive a troubled time? What do you actually want to do? Where has the Lord currently placed you? And so my prayer for this morning was that the word of God would liberate us And if you're single, I hope that the word of God will liberate you. You don't have to justify your singleness by showing that you are higher capacity than William Taylor or more godly than David Jackman or more prayerful than Don Carson. You don't even have to believe that you're happier as you are than you would be if you were able to get married. If you think you'd like to get married, that's not a failing. If the opportunity were to come, and they're a believer, and you actually wanted to marry someone, well, by all means, take it, Paul says. 1 Corinthians 7 is not here to bind us, to bind us to singleness, or to bind you to outdoing your married brothers and sisters in your devotion. I'm sure there are benefits to singleness, and there are freedoms, and there are opportunities. There are risks that you might be able to take, maybe. And God meets us where we are. Each of us has his own gift, and that's good. But it's not like that awful scene at the end of Saving Private Ryan, where with his last gasp, um, the officer who's managed to rescue Ryan says, earn it, earn it. No, Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. That is the primary benefit of singleness in a troubled time. And don't let anybody put a noose around your neck. And if you're married or engaged here this morning, I hope that the word of God liberates you. 1 Corinthians 7 is not in the Bible to make you feel guilty about being married. It just isn't. Of course, you need to be realistic. When you get married, your life becomes more complicated and more complicated lives make for more anxieties. You could make the same points about owning property or taking a promotion or taking out a student loan. Um, And a few things have the capacity to complicate life more quickly than family. And so if you were planning a wedding in a pandemic, say, you might choose to wait until the pandemic was over. You'd want to be realistic about what it would be like to have the first year of your marriage in lockdown. But Paul's aim is not to bind consciences. He doesn't want to throw a noose around your neck I think it is near scandalous that this passage has been used to bind consciences. Paul's purpose is, in fact, to overthrow the super-spirituality of those who would. Paul's aim is undistracted devotion. It's obedience to the commandments of the Lord Jesus. And then it is freedom from anxiety. And then it is liberty. 1 Corinthians 7 is a great school in Christian thinking, I think. Um, in decision-making to the glory of God. And what should these betrothed do? 
Well, number one, work out what really matters, not relationship status, but the call, the coming day, sanctification in body and soul. Number two, take a cold-eyed look at the world. What will make my life harder? And do I really want that right now? And then number three, do what you want. Three great steps for Christian decision-making, isn't it? Number one, be devoted to the Lord and obey his commandments, his actual commandments, not the ones invented by men. Number two, be basically sensible. And then number three, do what you want. And says Paul, down to earth, kind, sensible Paul, I too have the spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that every single one of us here this morning would be devoted to the Lord Jesus, body and soul. And we pray that our devotion to the Lord Jesus and our obedience to his commandments would set us free. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.